So, um, this evening we're here for the launch of this very handsome book, uh, The Tea Bowl, by Dr. Bonnie Kemsky. And apparently it hasn't actually been published yet, so this is uh, a sort of sneak, sneak preview. It's not going to be published until late next month. Um, so, uh, Bonnie Kemsky is a ceramic artist, a writer, um, and also has been studying, certainly on and off, uh, for some years, uh, Urasenke um, Tea Ceremony. Um, and she uh, started that when she was in Kyoto, um, where you visited for three months as part of your PhD. I think is that right? Earlier too. And earlier too. Yeah. Uh, you can't, can't do tea bowls without going to Kyoto quite a lot, I <laughs> expect. Um, and she has a PhD in, in ceramics from the Royal College of Art in London and was previously the um, editor of the magazine Ceramic Review and has published numerous uh, articles papers, reviews, and so on. So without further ado, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, let me have a sip here, make sure. It's wonderful to see you all tonight. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Jason, and thank you, Shiva, for some of you for inviting me. It's so good to be launching this book here at Daiwa because over the years I've seen so many wonderful presentations and things here. So I'm, I feel really honored to be here to do this. And as Jason said, the book is actually officially released yet. Bloomsbury has allowed us to bring some copies, but it's not actually released until the 24th of, of August. So you're getting a very much a sneak preview. So as we said, um, my background is as a maker, although I do not make tea bowls, I make sculpture works that engage the body's sense of touch, which do, is related to tea. And the, the moment that I'm trying to create in my own work is that moment in tea when you hold the tea bowl in your hands and the world seems right. Everything seems right. So. Um, I'm going to open by reading a bit of the book because that seems appropriate. This is the open, some of the open opening sentences. Can you hear me all right back there? Because I yeah, tend to yeah. not pay attention to the mic. You okay? Good. As chinoyu, or tea ceremony, can be said to be one of the most Japanese of all Japanese arts, so the tea bowl, or the chawan, is often seen as the most Japanese of Japanese ceramics. Sometimes squat, plain, or appearing roughly made, the Japanese tea bowl is enigmatic. Grounded in its function, but communicating something well beyond its utility, this simple form carries an aesthetic loading that translates into myriad levels of understanding and misunderstanding. As the tea bowl made its way to Europe and the United States in the early 20th century, potters there must have learned with astonishment about the level of respect given to Japanese potters, individual tea bowls, and the tea bowl form itself. There is simply no equivalent in the West. No ceramic form engenders such deference in our culture. So I'm going to actually start by just, if I can make this thing work here, showing you how the tea bowl is handled. Now, somewhere in the audience, you should, this is Michi, who's here somewhere. Where are you? I saw you come in. There she is, looking beautiful in kimono. She very kindly was model for, uh, for the book. But I wanted to show you that the tea bowl is handled in a very different way than we handle Western ceramics. So you hold it with both your hands. Even at this <coughs> stage, uh, it's drunk, as you can see, still using both your hands. It's very much a physical contact, a very tactile experience. And here, this is after you've drunk your tea, you're allowed to take time to look at it. It's called Haiken. This may be the only time you ever get to see this tea bowl. It may be put away and you may never experience it again. Unlike us, we don't tend, you know, most tea bowls aren't put out on display. They're kept put away until they're used in the ceremony. So the whole 
way, the whole utility of the T-bone was different from in the West. Now, I'm going to take you through a very quick rumble of the history of the T-bone and Japanese ceramics, because there isn't time to spend on this. And I really want to get to contemporary bowls, because I think that's what will engage a lot of, of people, is the differences and the changes that have happened in the contemporary tea bowl. So tea bowls came from China originally with tea through the monasteries. Uh, the earliest ones were uh, Tianware or Tanoku, so they were conical in shape and they used to dye. I'll show you a picture in a minute. But uh, this is what we often think of as the most tea bowl of tea bowls. This is a cho attributed to Chojiro, who was the first Raku. It wasn't called Raku at that point, but uh, this is the first one. And I'm going to read you just a very quick uh, bit from the book that I quote. This is from Kato Shuichi, who is a, a critic and an author. And he's talking in this, this is a, from a film uh, clip that was on uh, Japanese television. And it was from a series called Japan Spirit and Form. And he's talking about a Chojiro bowl, not this one, but one called Twilight. This tea bowl embraces all the characteristics of the psychological passage of human nature. We can feel with our senses that it's a summary of all the emotional ups and downs we experience with the passing of time. I'm growing old too, and approaching the twilight of my life, so for me too this is very meaningful. As I reflect back over my life, I somehow feel that everything all the things I've experienced over the long years is represented in this tea bowl. To me, this is a visible symbol of my own universe. So you can see that the tea bowl is very much venerated and has a very high standing in society. Uh, some old bowls that I thought you might like to see. As I said, this is the, uh, some of the earliest bowls. This is very early from China, and this is the stand. It, this, this bowl would you'd be used as a stand as well. Uh, in our case today, we still use this type of bowl, and it's still used in the stand, but the stands tend to be wooden or lacquer. Uh, and a cloud-shaped bowl, which is, uh, follows is later than the first of the Raku, and that's an Oribe style. Oribe himself, uh, uh, Oribe Furuta, was, was not a potter himself. Uh, but, and we don't know whether he actually contributed designs to the potters or whether it was simply his aesthetic that was copied by the potters. But nonetheless, he influenced the whole uh, genre of ceramics. And they were very irregular. If, if, if Senderikyu, who was the tea master of the 17th and 16th, 17th century, around there, was the person who sort of consolidated wabi, the <coughs> concept of wabi, in, in tea, and therefore in tea bowls. Uh, Oribe is the one who sort of turned it on its head. So whereas Riku very much appreciated accidental irregularity, Riku actually distorted his bowls and did strange things to it. Well, he didn't do them himself, but he encouraged the potters to do it. Uh, and then we're going down, this is a later Raku Ware at Kayatsu. I put this Shino one in, in particular, because Shino has come to the West in a big way. There are many Western potters who spend a lot of time, I'm looking at some of the potters in the audience, uh, who have, and you all know, all the potters know potters, who have spent their whole lives trying to develop the perfect Shino glaze. I think more probably in the U.S. than in the U.K. In the U.S. you get the Shino Fetish it, fetish. <laughs> uh, and hagi, because that's one of the three important bowls of the <coughs> tea ceremony. So that's the, a rip-roaring tale through. But the tea bowl traveled. And when the um, Japan opened up in the Meiji era, and Europeans began going there, and Jap Japanese started going out there, and exports started coming, a lot of Japanese ceramics came to Europe and to America. But most of those ceramics were later porcelains than what the traditional tea bowls are. So they were Imari wares or uh, Arita wares and wares that are colorful with uh, graphics of 
birds and flowers and all kinds of things, not at all like the rocky bowls that we've just seen. Some of those types of bowls did come to the West by some people like uh, Morse in, who went to the States and they're now in the Boston Museum of Art, of Fine Art. Uh, but the tea ball travels, but it was really this that began to, to make the tea ball have an impact in the West. So this is a photo from the Leach pottery, and this is, uh, oh, sorry, I pushed the wrong button here. That's Leach, of course, Bernard Leach, and that's Hamada Shoji. Uh, they collaborated a lot together, they worked together, they both came to set up the pottery in St. Ives, they went back to Japan together. Importantly, they also did a tour in America where they went from art college to art college and many public venues. And there, what, the, what would happen is Hamada would very quietly get on with throwing bowls on the wheel while Leach would pontificate about Zen Buddhism and the, you know, the magic of the, of the cer Japanese ceramics. So uh, as you can see, this is a Hamada bowl. Um, this actually is not that popular amongst people who practice tea ceremony because it's a bit later. This is Minge, which is what was part of uh, Hamada and Leach were both involved in or influenced or whatever, the link was there. And uh, these bowls are not that, but they're still beautiful bowls. So the Americans are coming. So Leach and Hamada had been in the States, so the seeds had been set. But even before that, something had come to America from Japan, which was to be tremendously influential. And that was the importation of Zen Buddhism, in particular Suzuki Daiatsu, who just blew Americans away with the understanding of Zen. And this is one of the results. And so Peter Volkus, who was very macho, a very performance man, he would go all around the country, and he was a big demonstrative guy who would do these big demonstrative pieces. It's part of the reason I didn't go into ceramics in the 1970s, because I really didn't want to make this kind of work. Uh, amazing stuff, though, amazing stuff. And his, even more important, probably, in Tebow history, is Paul Sodner, who was a student of his, his first student, actually. And Paul Sodner is credited with establishing Raku in the West. Now, they actually had read Bernard Leach's book, a potter's book, where he had talked about Raku, and that's how they decided to do Raku. They had, most of them had never, there had been a few potters who trained in Japan and came to the West and, and were doing Raku the way that the Raku dynasty was doing it, but they mostly had only read about it. So Paul Sodner was producing these bowls that he wasn't very happy with, and one day he got very cross and he threw the bowl in a pile of leaves, and the leaves caught fire, and something called reduction happened. So the, the, the fire always, in reduction what happens is the fire always wants to continue to burn. So it takes oxygen from wherever it can get it. And in this case it takes it from the clay and it takes it from the glazes. So it changes the quality that you get uh, from a rock if it's been post-reduction fi post fired. In addition to that, you get this smoking effect because there's smoke. So the, the, as we saw in that first bowl that I showed that Nietzsche was demonstrating, the smoke can go into the crackle and into the glaze, into the, um, the crazing in the glaze, and you get that sort of fine black line that you are probably all very familiar with. So this is Western Raku. When Sodner and someone named Rick Hirsch actually took Raku, what they thought was Raku, to Japan, and they did a demonstration of it for the crown prince and for Kichizaim on the 14th, Raku the 14th. And Raku the 14th was apparently incredibly angry and said, this is not Raku and you cannot call it Raku. But I'm afraid that that boat had already sailed. Uh, there were already many, many potters in America and also some here by that time who were doing this kind of Raku firing. So I think that what we need to do is we just simply need to 
distinguish them. So this is a Western Raku or American Raku, sometimes even called California Raku. Here's, a, here, here's the, the bowl with Michi holding it again. It's a good example of what's happening in Raku. This is a bowl that was made the year before last, I think, wasn't it, Michi? Was, uh, and it, the bowl was made by Sonia Lewis, and Peter Calciuti decorated it. He's a well-known Chinese brush painter and also uh, a teacher at the Senke tea ceremony. So there are bowls that are made in the West that are used in shinoyu or in tea ceremony. Some of you might know Lisa Hannon's bowls, uh, beautiful, and they're used. Uh, uh, her work is particularly known because of the soda firing that she, she does and also the shino glazes. The soda firing is a completely Western development that went back to Japan and many traditional Japanese bowls being made today use soda or sodium or salt firing in addition. It was taken back by Hamada. It was originally a German technique that came to England. Hamada learned it when he was over here. Bernard Leach already knew about it. And it went back to Japan. And so it's, it's used quite extensively now around the world for making tea bowls and other, other ceramic wares. This is John Baymore in America. He's at the uh, New Hampshire Institute of Art, and he actually teaches a course called Chawan, Chanoyu for Chawan or something. So he has his students come in, and not only does he teach them how to make tea bowls, he teaches them something about tea ceremony. So he thinks it's very important that they're not just making bowls that go out there and don't have any relation to, the, to actual tea ceremony. And Tim Rowan, another example of usable bowls. And I want to say that contemporary, we're moving into contemporary bowls now. Contemporary tea bowls are not restricted to the West. Uh, contemporary ceramics in Japan is very strong, very vibrant. There's a lot going on. And a lot of those potters are now making tea bowls, even the ones in traditional ceramic families. It used to be that if you were in a ceramic family, and uh, learn the techniques, you would stick with those techniques. Now they're branching out. I'll show you a bowl in a minute where it's a good example of this. So this, is, this bowl is made by one of the young Bizen potters who was here two years ago, I think it was. Did anyone else come to that talk? They were lovely. Six young guys came over from Japan. Although they're from traditional Bizen uh, families, pottery families. They're actually doing these unusual tea bowls. Interestingly, Bizen is not normally known for tea bowls. It's known for other... It's, it, usually the surface is rather dry, and so we tend to use it for things like vases and mizasashi, which is the water container, things that are associated with water, because it shows that, that so well. Uh, here's another one of those six young Bizen potters. The bizen, is, you can see that those marks on it are from wrapping cords or seaweed, uh, depending, usually cords, wrapped around it before it's fired. And here's a, this tea bowl is my tea bowl. I bought this tea bowl in 2004 when I was in Kyoto at a ceramics gallery, and the exhibition that it was in was called Tea Bowls. Chawan. And I bought this tea bowl, and then later on, as part of my PhD, I went and interviewed Kayoko's husband, Oshino Satoru. Satoru. And when I arrived at their house, and we were talking, I realized that it was Kayoko's tea bowl I had bought. And she then, in the next hour and a half, proceeded to tell me three times that this was not a tea bowl. <laughs> And that's partly because those people who were not from the traditional tea bowl making families, who were in, from ceramics, from a different, you know, who came into ceramics without the background behind them, really didn't want to be associated with traditional tea bowl making. Uh, that's, that's changed a lot. And it's completely different from in the West. I mean, in the West, uh, almost anybody will have a go at making a tea bowl. I'll show you some tea bowls later, of potters that maybe should never have made tea bowls, but <laughs> nonetheless. Um, this, is this, this man's work is very popular now. You see a lot of it in New York and things. 
I'm told that these tea bowls are actually used to make tea. I would find that very disturbing to drink out of myself. <laughs> but they are amazing. They are absolutely amazing. They are all colorful. They all have this wonderful crawling surfaces and golds and silvers. and oh, They're just astounding. If you want to see some interesting bowls, you really should look at those. <coughs> So I'm going to run you through some of the Western techniques that have, been, that have made tea bowls different, created this new category that I'm calling contemporary tea bowl. So these tea bowls are not necessary. They may never have matcha or green tea made in them. They may sit on a plinth for their entire lives or on somebody's mantelpiece. Yet, to me, they're still tea bowls because they have the cultural background before them. They're, they're still trying to uh, convey some of the spiritual background of tea. At any rate, it's up for you to judge whether you think they are or not. This is Elke Sada in Germany. The way that Elke makes her work is she has a glass pane or a plastic pane, and she does her slip, which is liquid clay with color in it, uh, onto the, the glass. She then does slabs of clay onto the glass, cuts out her slabs, and forms the bowl. Slab, slab formation this way, slab building, is not a traditional Japanese tea bowl technique. The Japanese ceramics in general, they use slabbing, but not for tea bowls. But this would be a usable tea bowl. I quite like this uh, Marian Angelica one because it shows two different things. One, it, you can see that she felt free to use this kind of texturing because of the tradition of rough and textured tea bowls from the past. But also, what's different is that she's using porcelain. Traditional tea bowls are not in porcelain. And she's using a celadon glaze. Again, there, historically, there were celadon tea bowls being made from China, and mostly, not so much in Japan. but. What we associate with the classic Japanese tea bowl is, is not celadon, it's not porcelain. Eddie Curtis. Uh, this would be a hard tea bowl to use in tea ceremony. You need to wipe the surface of the bowl in tea ceremony. You'd be hard pressed to do it, and yet I love this bowl. I think the texture and the depth and the, the complexity, and yet it's such a simple form. I just think it's a wonderful piece. Jack Doherty. I use this image in particular because this shows what's happening. This shows that the context of the tea bowl is shifting. So the tea bowls are not being seen in the tea room. They're being seen in other settings, and in this case, a domestic setting. He calls this the blue tea bowl on the blue cupboard. And that was also soda fired, by the way. This is a lovely bowl by the Coleman's. <coughs> Dalloon, who's a French potter. What's interesting about this, again, a Western technique, not used in Japan at all. This is a terra sigillata bowl. Terra sigillata is a very, very fine clay slip or liquid. Uh, and it dates back to ancient Greece, it? or even farther. And it's the black and red of, of, of ancient Greece. So it's very, very Western. I, I don't think that there's any Japanese, if anyone knows of any Japanese use of terrace gelato, would you tell me? Uh, and he, and there are, he's not the only potter who's now making terrace gelato tea bowls. Terrace gelato is not terribly good at, it's not robust. So if you were to use this in a tea ceremony, you would mark it because of the whisk, the bamboo whisk that you use in the bottom after a lot of use. It would become marked. But it does have a lovely, lovely feel. Terra sigillata has a satiny, just slightly, slightly uh, lustrous surface to it. It's what I finish my own sculptures in often, and it's just lovely. Yeah. Um, this piece, uh, Red Sky, is this the name of a series of pots, or is it the name of only this pot? Only that pot. If you're interested, uh, his website's quite good, and I would look up his, some of his other pieces. He does have a first name, but he doesn't use it. And this is Marcio Matos, who I put this one in because I think it shows the traditional Japanese technique of hakame, which is a brushwork 
Usually it's a white brushwork on a darker uh, clay body, but in this case he often uses uh, colors and things. I think that Michi found this bowl quite challenging to use, didn't you, Michi? But you, you liked it in the end, didn't you? <laughs> and there's nothing more English than slipware. So I thought I had to include a bowl that has a very English technique. Slipware is where you use the liquid clay with color in it to decorate the surface, and then it has a clear glaze over it. Ashley Howard, this kind of graphic is very Western. Uh, I particularly like this bowl because of this skittery line. He's used a, a ceramic pencil. I think it's very interesting graphically. And calligraphy. There are some tea bowls and old tea bowls that have Japanese calligraphy on them, although it's, they're not, you don't see a lot of them if you're looking for them. But Calligraphy is being used a lot in Western bowls now. This is uh, Sylvia Messia, and what's interesting about his work is that they, it actually reflects his Algerian background and childhood. So in his calligraphy on his bowls, he uses both Arabic and French and some other strange Messian language that he's made up. Uh, but what really I like very much is this little stamp. So just as uh, a Japanese scroll or a Chinese scroll would have the red stamp of the, of the calligrapher on it, he's put his initials in this little red square. This is a potter who doesn't make tea bowls, okay? Uh, Philip Eglin's known for his sculpture work and mostly known for his satire. And that's the reason I put this piece in in particular, because it's satiric. This does not happen in Japan. You don't see humor and satire conveyed through a tea bowl. Uh, for one thing, you don't bring issues from the outside, political issues or government issues or those kinds of problems into the tea room. You leave those outside the tea room. But this is a generic pope. <coughs> And what it doesn't show is on the inside, there are very scantily clad dancing <laughs> girls. Uh, so I think that, as you can see, what's happened is that the Western Tea Bowl is, has a different aim. And the aim is that it's, one of the aims is that it's being used to respond to the world. It's <coughs> responding to the world locally. This piece is from a series that was done after the Yorkshire 2012 Yorkshire floods. And uh, Anna Lambert lives up there, and she was very affected by it. She did a series. This piece reflects where the potter Maggie Zarafa lives. She lives in the Isle of Skye. And what she says is she doesn't want to actually represent the mountains and the sea, but she wants you to have a sense of the mountains and the sea that surround her when she's making her work. And Jeff Minchin, this is probably the, a landscape piece that actually has a more ecological or more environmental statement about it. This, uh, this bowl reflects drought. And this piece of wood that's under it is actually from the bottom of a dry lake that was caused by drought. And it's a, reflect, it's a reflection of global warming. And potters are re responding to the world on global with global issues as well, like we just saw. Rob Cornell was very moved by the Fukushima disaster, and he did a series of three different Chawan or tea bowls. The first one he did in ice, so that when you use them, they disintegrated, they disappeared. The second one, the second series, was all in this black. And what he does is he's, they have been thrown as cylinders, and then the cylinders have been torn and cut and reassembled. And in this third series, what he was hoping to convey, he says, is a sense of hope and rebirth by including the pink with the black after Fukushima. This bowl still always moves me. Uh, this Alistair White did this bowl to uh, mark the anniversary of the dropping of the first atomic bomb in Hiroshima. 
And the glaze, one of the components of the glaze is human ash. So potters are also using the tea bowl to respond personally. This is a very moving installation done by Stephen Brownman, who's known as a Western Raku uh, potter. He lost his, his son died many years ago, and for one year after that, as his Kaddish, which is a Jewish ritual of mourning, he made nothing but a single tea bowl every day, wherever he was. And he marked them all. And this tea bowl that you can see in the forefront was the one that he made on his son Jared's birthday after he had died. It took him 10 years, but 10 years after Jared's death, he then glazed the tea bowls and finally was able to exhibit them. But I just thought this is such a moving use of, of the tea bowl as a, a way of both for him, cathartically and, and uh, therapeutically, if you will, but also for him to also convey the importance of life and death after his son's death. So as I think, I hope that what you will come to to agree with me is that their contemporary tea bowls are tea bowls. They're just tea bowls in new homes with new contexts. And here's a context. This is my husband's in the audience. This is our dining room. And this uh, Amish quilt, I, I took this picture because this is a handmade Amish quilt from near where I grew up in America with English-made porcelain tea bowls. And in the background, you can see there's a Japanese plate and there's Victorian silhouettes, which were from my grandmother and some of my own work and an old Seth Thomas American clock. So very eclectic. So I'm going to finish this talk by reading a little bit of the last chapter. It may seem strange that an object so completely invested with Japanese-ness should also resonate within cultures that come from European roots. But you need only see how many contemporary ceramic artists produce tea bowls and how many collectors buy them to know that the tea bowl's monumental legacy its pastness has accompanied it as it traveled beyond Japan's shores. In the 21st century, the tea bowl has found new cultural territories to inhabit in Japan and beyond. The classic chawan, or tea bowl, used in tea ceremony, held in both hands and placed on tatami in the spare beauty of the tea room, is still found in Shinoyu. These include temp contemporary tea bowls that have been influenced by contemporary potters working within their own cultural paradigms and ceramic knowledge bases with materials and techniques new to the tea bowl. The tea bowl is adapting to fit its new cultures and habitats. And as styles and techniques have shifted in contemporary ceramics, so has this enigmatic ceramic form. With the tea bowl's to totemic status, its layers of meaning, veneration, and cultural depth, it is not, as one rather cynical potter has said, just a cereal bowl with a bigger price tag. <laughs> Even contemporary tea bowls, which may never hold matcha and may, uh, and may not even be held within the palms, carry some of the tea bowl's rich heritage and cultural significance. Its shape, and proportions please us. Its simplicity draws us. The subtlety of its color and the accidental quality of its glazing slow down and deepen the way we perceive it, satisfying us with a quiet complexity and a subtle, timeless strength. This is the iconic T-Bowl. Thank you.